So we're going to get started then. Thank you everyone for coming both uh, in person and on Zoom and everyone who's now going to be uh, listening in or watching um, after the fact, because if the choice is between, you know, uh, reading about the great British baking show, The Musical, at three in the morning when you have insomnia or watching a really cool program about AI. I know what you'd rather do. Um, so this panel is about artificial intelligence, machine learning in false advertising litigation. So for us to understand how that works, we need to know what is AI, what is machine learning, what is false advertising and this other thing, what is litigation? Um, so, we have a series of panelists who are going to explore the ways in which recent increases in computing power, innovations in analytical methods, and the proliferation of digitized text and image data, as in social media posts, have made AI and ML increasingly useful in matters involving allegations of false advertising. Who do we have with me? I have Amy Lally, who's a partner at Sidley Austin here in the Los Angeles office. Then I have James Lee next to her, a principal in Cornerstone Research, also here in Los Angeles and in the next building, um, you know, down the hall from my uh, office, I have Vlad Lu, who is a professor of marketing, a full professor of marketing, uh, you know, within the last, what, two or three years? <laughs> Which means she's fully awesome now. Okay, so I'm going to get started. So welcome to everyone who's here, uh, giving you just a sort of set of what's going on, what's at stake. Uh, I've introduced the panel, so basically you now have a sense of what we're talking about. And this being in a law cool building, we're gonna start with a hypothetical because that's the only thing we know how to do in this building. Um, and this is just one of many examples that we could use, especially when the allegedly false and misleading terms can have many interpretations. So think of what does clean and natural mean? It may be something different from you, for you than when say my mother comes to visit and her first sense of clean and natural is perhaps different. What does safe mean? What does environmentally friendly mean? You know, so a lot of times we have to figure this out. And we're going to, after having gone through a hypothetical, we will spend time on thinking about uh, falsity and materiality questions. And then we'll get questions from you because it's so much fun when we talk, but it's so much more fun when we get participation. Um, so let's start with the setup of a hypothetical. Maybe we'll start with uh, you on, on that. Okay, so the hypothetical grounded in a false advertising class action. False advertising class actions can be premised on a few different things. They can be premised on an allegation that a company said something that was false. They can be premised on the allegation that a company said something that was true absolutely true, but nonetheless misleading. They could be premised on the foundation that a company implied something that was false, so didn't say it at all. Or they could be premised on the assumption of that or the allegation that a company implied something that was truthful, but nonetheless misleading. So the grayest area that we could find, again, possible a school of law. We really want to like focus on gray areas. The grayest area would be implied claims. So that's what our hypothetical is. Our hypothetical is about a um, company called Beauty Company. They never said that their product was uh, clean and natural. However, they did uh, run an advertising campaign for one of their products that uh, will be referred to as the Mountain Fresh advertising campaign. They also ran an advertising campaign about their cosmetic product that will be referred to as the hydrating um, uh, advertising campaign. And the allegation in this hypothetical false advertising class action is that uh, all reasonable consumers 
believed that the Mountain Fresh and hydrating advertising campaigns were implying that beauty company's product was clean and natural and that beauty company's product is not clean and natural and that nobody would have bought the product if they had known that beauty company's product wasn't clean and natural. So that is the hypothetical that we are, uh, that we're faced with. So uh, to walk through the elements of, of the cause of action, the first thing that the class is gonna have to show is that a beauty company was making an implied clean and natural claim. Then they're gonna to have to show that, um, uh, the, uh, that, that the product uh, was not in fact clean and natural. Then they're gonna to have to show that all reasonable consumers would have, um, um, would have received that implied message, believed that implied message, acted on that implied um, message, meaning that was a purchase driver. It was a reason why they bought the product. Because if consumers don't care, if that's not why they're buying the product, then there was no harm, right? So if um, at any one of these stages, the whole case could fall apart. If all reasonable consumers didn't think the product was clean and natural. That wasn't the implied message they took. They didn't take any implied message. They had no reason to believe or think if the product was clean and natural. They didn't believe it was clean and natural. The case fails. Even if all reasonable consumers thought the product was, uh, was clean and natural, uh, if they would have bought the product anyways, the case fails. So we're going to focus on those two data points and the super smart people around me are going to talk about how we can use, they can use AI and machine learning uh, to help us understand those two points. So you all feel comfortable with the hypo. <laughs> going a little more into a little more detail. This is the fun part. I just ask questions, but unlike class, they've done the reading. Um, so let me ask you a basic question. So for false, the question is, were the challenge statements in fact false or misleading? Why does this actually matter fundamentally from a legal perspective, right? Words matter. Um, right. So um, in the in the law, right, we're talking about the class action. It's grounded in the law. That means it has to be grounded in a um, a cause. It has to be grounded in a cause of action. And you can't sue people for things that they never said and did. Now the law has extended that to be said or did directly or implicitly. Um, but just because you have a thought or you have a feeling or you have an impression um, that if the company didn't say that, you don't, you don't get to file lawsuits and or certainly prevail on lawsuits for idiosyncratic um, beliefs and impressions and, and understanding. So the fundamental starting point for a false advertising class action is going to be the plaintiff's burden to prove that the company in fact um, made an explicit or implicit claim. So first they have to actually make the claim. That's the first, the first step. And then the plaintiff also has to prove that not only did the company actually make that claim, but that everybody um, also would find it to be false and misleading. Again, we're talking about a class action. So it's not an idiosyncratic, well, you did make this claim and I personally was misled because I had these other beliefs and expectations and perspectives. The plaintiff has to prove that everybody in the class, the reasonable consumer, 
would have had the same um, uh, the same beliefs, perspectives, and, and understanding. So without those two things, it sort of becomes irrelevant whether it's it's true or false. It's simply not actionable. Yep. And so this is where some of the expert analysis can come in is um, because apparently to prove something, we need more than just law. Yes, it's good to have evidence as well. <laughs> yeah, and so um, the, the, this is where an expert can come in. And what we wanna highlight today are the ways in which we can take conceptual analyses that have been around for a good while, and we can undertake those conceptual analyses using some of the newer tools that have come about in the last several years, um, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let's just go back specifically to the, to the hypothetical. And we're just gonna show here some example images that um, Beauty Company, Beauty Co, um, ran during its two at issue campaigns. And so the first is the Mountain Fresh campaign, and then the second is the Hydrating campaign. And even before you get to machine learning um, and AI, there are analyses that an expert can do to try to get at the question of um, this implied message. What was the implied message that Example Beauty Company was putting out? And there's a, a couple of stages that you can do in this analysis. This is again, before AI and machine learning. You know, very simply, stage one is you can measure the frequency with which the company made the alleged statements. So to keep things interesting, as Amy mentioned in our hypothetical, Beauty Co. never actually said clean and natural. So then you have to go to the next level of the analysis. And that next level can be looking at the marketing materials of example Beauty Co. So in this slide, we're showing images, but they also have text um, that they are putting out. And you can look for words or images that are similar or related to clean and natural. What might a reasonable consumer interpret to be clean and natural, even if he or she is not seeing that exact word? Now for that, uh, how do you determine those, what, what those terms are, what those images are? So an expert can go to um, an external source, maybe public press articles or trade journals or um, uh, the marketing of other brands that are recognized in the profession as being clean and natural brands. And she can go to that uh, set of brands and say, okay, these are brands that are identified as clean and natural, maybe, and it doesn't even have to be the same industry. So it doesn't have to be a, another beauty brand. It can be a, a food company brand that, you know, calls itself clean and natural because it gets clean and natural ingredients. And the expert can look at the types of material that's being um, put out in that company's advertising, and then go see if similar types of material, whether it's text or images, show up in the advertising of example of the beauty company. And um, often that would involve, you know, collecting the advertisements from beauty company and collecting advertisements from other uh, companies as well. And then there'd be typically a somewhat manual um, process where uh, the expert or coders that the expert would instruct would go through those marketing materials that the company put out and identify this is an image that has the characteristic that could be imp uh, implied uh, to be clean and natural. And so that, that analysis should be undertaken. It's a very valid analysis. But what Land is gonna describe in depth is how we can take the underlying concepts. So again, one of the important things I think for this panel to emphasize is that conceptually, the approach is similar. It's just a matter of we have new tools that can help remove some of the subjectivity of some of this earlier analysis that I was describing and bring a more uh, a systematic approach to it. Uh, so the expert could undertake those analyses and those analyses are all valid analyses, but they, were, they would be time consuming because you would have to go through in a somewhat manual way, a lot of marketing materials. Um, they also involve some judgment calls. So even if the expert does her best job to, to tell the coders that this is what clean and natural is, 
there's still some judgment calls there. And because of those two reasons, sometimes you would work with a sample of the company's marketing materials, when ideally you would have the universe of those materials. And so I'm gonna pass the baton to Lan here um, in a second, but I think that just to what we can highlight is that the, it's the advances in um, computing power. So we now can actually analyze a lot of images you know, in a short amount of time. Um, the methods of um, analyzing images and text, which Lan is gonna get into, um, allow for uh, a, a, another way that can complement some of the uh, more traditional forms of what I'll call content analysis. Thank you so much, Danny. So I'm going to uh, talk about, let's say in this hypothetical case, right? How would we leverage machine learning and AI methods for, uh, for, to help us really figure out to really consumers uh, form that perception that this particular uh, brand, the focal brand uh, is a clean and natural brand. Uh, so in this slide, you can see here what we could have done in this in this particular case. We could actually look at the focal companies, all the social media posts. So in this case, like Danny said, you know, in the old days, we may have to sample, you know, a certain marketing material from the company. And in this case, we can actually do it at scale. We can uh, look at the focal companies, all the social media posts uh, starting from 2018 to 2022. And this could cover multiple different type of campaigns the company uh, could have run in the past. And how do we figure out, let's say, if this particular campaign really focus on clean and natural? So that's kind of the fundamental question. So how would we do today? So in the old days, you know, uh, the expert will work with the human coders to identify the keywords. Like here, uh, we have some examples such as refreshing, clean, outdoor, etc. So in this particular case, let's say if uh, I were expert working on this case, I would still uh, work with a set of human coders. And uh, what we'll do is we'll actually, let's say, randomly sample perhaps like you know, 200, 500 uh, posts uh, from the focal company. And we will go through the list of the, uh, all the posts and to identify a, a set of keywords. We call that the library of keywords. We believe kind of related to the you know, focal uh, term, clean and natural. And once we identify that set of keywords, we can actually use machine learning techniques to easily you know, try to identify and scan through every single social media post from the focal company during a long time period to identify the set of keywords so we can uh, create a uh, plot like this. We can also do something similar uh, for images. So how do we do this for images? Nowadays, uh, there are lots of very advanced uh, computation techniques. Uh, they can do a great job of uh, identifying uh, objects in the images. Again, for this particular case, what I would do is I, I start with working with human coders. I will have them go through a random sample of uh, you know, images from this focal company's uh, marketing material. And then we'll identify the the objects we believe that you know customers will perceive as clean and natural. Here we give some examples such as you know like forest, rain, mountains, water, etc. Once we identify that list of the keywords, uh, we can create a chart like this to really kind of uh, show us you know if the focal campaign indeed convey um, a, a lot of uh, additional information about the clean and natural. We can also uh, show for this particular case for this company, this company actually ran uh, many different types of marketing campaigns and some of the other campaigns did not really focus on, on clean and natural at all. And another thing I also want to uh, uh, point out here is this uh, construct of clean and natural uh, is actually compound. Uh, if you think about it, right, clean by itself is pretty uh, simple construct. So uh, if you talk to consumers, we all have pretty, you know, pretty good ideas of, you know, what's considered clean. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also have um, pretty good ideas about what's considered natural. But how, what's, how do we think about clean and natural uh, together? That's more of a, you know, holistic view, which makes this case also more interesting. So on this slide, we'll list some examples of, you know, uh, some brands, uh, if you look at their past marketing material, you can probably safely say that, you know, for those set of brands on the left, 
uh, they their primary marketing positioning is you know they are the clean brand. And on the other uh, side of the panel, we can see a set of brands. Uh, clearly, they have very very different type of marketing uh, positioning. Anything uh, but clean. Okay, go to the next slide. I also want to show you that uh, just like I mentioned, uh, this concept of clean and natural uh, is actually a compound, uh, is a combination of two, uh, some uh, related but different uh, constructs. Uh, again, you know, we can use a uh, uh, simple uh, text mining or image analysis, look through uh, many companies' marketing material to identify the set of uh, brands that are you know, typically position themselves as clean and natural. And there's also a, a set of brands uh, who uh, you know, have any other type of marketing positioning. Another thing I also want to emphasize here is we don't have to focus on the focal product category. So you can see here, we actually, we can, uh, when we try to identify this construct of clean and natural brands versus other position brand, we can look at any industry. Uh, so the clean and natural uh, could be you know, really uh, a particular construct that could apply uh, to uh, brands across multiple industries. So what, uh, after we identify the set of companies that we believe you know, based on their marketing material from the past, they consider themselves as you know, clean and natural brands, we can actually, you know, uh, again, uh, use machine learning to uh, go through all those brands' uh, own social media posts. And in this particular case, we chose uh, seven companies, and those seven companies, they identify themselves as uh, clean and natural brands. We can look at uh, the number of posts they have for their own, uh, own social media posts, and also for each brand, we can perform uh, image analysis and text, ana uh, text mining to really, for each post, we can come up with a score. I say this score could be, uh, you know, range from zero to one with a higher number means that this particular post really convey this clean and natural uh, um, construct. Again, you know, we can do this for uh, images and also for text, and we can um, uh, uh, combine the image and text uh, scores together. Uh, so we can, for each company, uh, uh, the, the seven companies on the top, we have a score. And uh, you can see they, uh, they tend to score relatively high uh, because those companies, they position themselves as clean and natural. We can also have you know, a set of uh, other brands and those brands uh, at the bottom of this chart, uh, they have any other positioning, could be you know, being powerful, being fast, being luxury, anything uh, but clean and natural. So this also give us uh, you know, some validation that you know, uh, this whatever method we develop actually works because you know, uh, the companies who uh, claim themselves as being clean and natural indeed um, kind of uh, convey that message in their uh, social media post. And after we develop the method, um, uh, like I said, we could develop the method across uh, multiple uh, brands, uh, across multiple industries. Now we can zoom in um, to the focal industry, the beauty brands. Uh, and here again, we have you know, a set of brands that uh, position themselves as clean and natural. They tend to have higher scores. If you focus on, you know, uh, the social media post uh, of their own brands. And if they say, you know, they're clean and natural, we have also another set of uh, brands that, you know, they have any other positioning, but uh, clean and natural. We have also the focal uh, company um, in the middle. We can do something very similar like we already did. We can, uh, this time we can apply that to uh, the focal product industry. And in this case, you can see that for the, uh, company, uh, example, Beauty uh, Corporation, uh, actually, uh, if you look through, you know, all the company's social media posts uh, from 2018 to 2022, the company does not score very high in terms of uh, uh, promoting uh, their clean and natural uh, brand image, uh, particular when you contrast this to other competitors in the industry, uh, clearly that's not the company's uh, focal brand position. Okay, so I think we now have a bit of background of how law may work, a bit of background of how machine learning works in this particular type of context. So let's dig a little further in. 
So Andy, let's start with you. In a hypothetical world, we understand how this works. You live in the real world. And in the real world, we have judges. There are decisions. They, they, they are published decisions. Do we have such published decisions where judges are grappling uh, with this sort of machine learning based uh, set of tools to better help us understand whether or not such uh, advertising may in fact uh, false or misleading? Are you ready for the answer? This is super duper exciting. This is going to be on the bar exam. Oh, which reminds me, for those of you who are practicing <laughs> lawyers, your code for continuing legal education is MLFAL2023. No. Um, but there is there is one unpublished decision. Um, but before I turn to that, you know, I, I want to sort of emphasize from like a real world perspective how fun this hypothetical is, uh, because clean and natural are two words that have no regulatory definition whatsoever. Um, there is no authoritative body that has defined those words for consumers or for industry. And there can be as many understandings of those words as there are human beings. Um, so for one person, clean may mean um, that product is the end result of an entirely clean supply chain where from the sourcing of the raw materials to the purchase of the end product, there was no uh, environmental impact whatsoever. To another person, natural may mean completely not processed. That product was not processed in any sort of way and there was no machinery involved in the creation of that product and so the uh, ai machine learning uh, that that james Mar are talking about can also be used to show that to show that clean and natural are not words that are susceptible to common proof they are not class actions that can be certified because the understanding of those terms is too disparate across the consumer population. Um, courts understand, they have recognized that uh, AI and machine learning are powerful tools. They haven't had um, a lot of opportunity to admissibility. My awesome colleague, Thomas, will teach us. He found one case, not a published case. That's why the answer was no. An unpublished case from Louisiana that involved a copyright claim. And so there was a sports team that had developed a mascot. And there was an uh, entertainment company that had a film with a cartoon character. And the allegation was that the cartoon character infringed the copyright of the, uh, of the mascot. And uh, the plaintiff uh, proposed an expert witness who uh, uh, reliably applied mathematical analysis using artificial intelligence, spatial and target algorithms to predict human response to seeing those two images, to seeing the mascot and to see the cartoon character. And with the support of AI, the expert concluded that most people would find those two images to be substantially similar, which was a necessary element of the copyright cause of action. Um, in determining whether or not that expert's opinion was admissible, the court conducted your traditional FRE 702 analysis. Uh, a witness is qualified as an expert by having knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education uh, uh, that will assist the trier of fact in understanding uh, the evidence or to determine a fact and issue uh, based on sufficient facts and data, uh, product of reliable 
scientific uh, methods and the expert reliably applied those measures. That's your 702 analysis. And the court did that and found that the expert's opinion was admissible. Uh, one other court in Virginia has sort of noted that artificial intelligence and machine learning are complex enough issues that um, expert testimony is proper and helpful um, uh, on those topics. And there's been um, you know, some, some scholarly article writing on the topic, but not uh, you know, sort of a wealth of published cases yet to, to go by. Yeah, one thing that I'll add is that that example case reminded me of this. So in the example that Lan uh, discussed and that's on the screen now, that's an example of where the expert collects marketing materials from two different types of companies or brands. One set um, are brands that are um, identified as clean and natural based on typically an external source, like a trade journal or an academic article or something like that. And then the other set um, are identified as, we call them other position brands. These are just brands that are emphasizing something besides being clean and natural. And then we tr you train an algorithm as to what those two things are, and then you feed in the focal company, and it tells you whether the marketing materials of the focal company are more similar to group A to group B. There are other methods of machine learning related to images, and your example case made me think of this, where you can do, um, you don't have to train an algorithm, you can just have a measure of similarity. And so in the case of your example, there is a single image or a set of images that has um, that's, that's an issue. And then you can do a measure of similarity um, between other images and that one focal image. So there are different ways to approach the question and there are different tools that you can use depending on whatever the question is. Yeah, and I think also here, uh, uh, just the kind of piggyback on Danny's point about there are different tools, uh, different ways to approach this question. For example, how do you um, kind of analyze images, right? If you think about, you know, do consumers perceive this image as being clean and natural? So there are two different ways of doing this. One way is you could identify a set of objects uh, in the image that consumers typically associate with being clean and natural. So that's, that's one way. Another option is you could actually uh, develop your own clean and natural label. So uh, for clean and natural, like Amy said, you know, this particular construct is kind of, you know, um, combined two different things. Uh, so if there's no existing image API out there that will give you this clean and natural uh, label. So if you, you know, go through using like Google API or, you know, uh, like uh, Amazon's AWS image API, you possibly can get labels for clean. Can also get labels for natural, but you know, clean and natural, this combination would not exist. So let's say if I'm an expert on this particular case, what I would do is I would uh, actually, you know, uh, sample a, a set of uh, marketing material images to a set of a human coders and ask them to, you know, rate uh, the image on, let's say, five point scale in terms of whether or not you perceive this uh, image as being clean and natural. So then I will uh, develop our, uh, our own uh, deep learning model to really kind of capture the holistic view of whether this image, uh, you know, uh, had conveyed this construct of clean and natural. This could be a higher order construct of, you know, different like, the color, maybe the composition of the image was in the image, et cetera. So those are different ways we can construct uh, this clean and, um, um, and uh, natural uh, uh, score uh, based on the images. I want to move us, if I can, to the evidentiary question. Are these challenge statements, in fact, false and or misleading? So there's a legal aspect that you're going to bring expertise to bear, and then there's the experts who will somehow prove this. Um, so is Mountain Fresh or Hydrating? Are either of these campaigns false or misleading because of the term being clean and natural? Amy, set us up how you could work through this. If you were uh, involved in, in 
defending this kind of suit. Right. So then that second big question that the AI and the machine learning is going to be used for is to um, is to attack that second part of what the plaintiffs have to prove. So they have to prove the company applied this message. Not only did all reasonable consumers uh, take that, that take away that implied message and have a common understanding about it, but also that it mattered. That it's why they bought. Uh, that's why they bought the product. That they didn't buy it because of the price. They didn't buy it because that they have brand loyalty to that brand. They didn't buy it because um, of the colors used on the packaging. That they really like dark blue. They're drawn to those dark blue boxes. Um, they they didn't buy it because uh, friends and family had used it and said, look. I really like this product, you could try it too, that the reason why they bought it was because of this implied uh, message that they had this common um, understanding for. Because again, this is like actual litigation. So it's about, is there harm? Should there be damages or restitution? And if you buy a product because someone you're, friend or relative says, I really like this product, you should buy it too. You were going to always buy that product because they recommended it to you. Lots of, people, lots of us do that. You got exactly what you were paying for. You got the thing that someone who used the product referred you to buy and you bought it. Perfect. Um, if you always buy this brand of product every time they come out with a new one, you try it because you love this brand. You love everything about this brand. You've always loved their products. You were always going to buy that product when they when they launched it, because that's what you do. So uh, the second thing that the plaintiffs have to prove is that it was a purchase driver. It was material to the purchase decision that, uh, that the applied claim or natural claim was material to purchase decision. It's why consumers bought the product. It mattered. They cared. Yes, and um, on this front, I think that the machine learning analysis can can help answer uh, really look at two two outcomes um, in terms of answering this question. The first is uh, we can directly measure, and this this is both machine learning and just the availability of new data such as social media posts. We can directly measure what consumers are saying about the brand. So in that first analysis that we discussed, that was looking at what the brands were putting out and then how a reasonable consumer would interpret that brand output relative to what else is available on the market. With the proliferation of things like social media, people talk on social media, <laughs> people post a lot. And so we can look at how consumers are discussing the brand when they make a post about the brand. And you know, previously there were ways that we could get at this question uh, we could run surveys, uh, we could ask consumers, and these are still very valid methods. So you can still do surveys and you can still look at, you know, consumer, customer management relationship databases that the companies have where people call and comment on the product or write a review about the product. Um, those are all still very valid, but I think that the machine learning techniques and the availability of social media data really opens up a new front on this consumer perceptions uh, uh, question. And then secondly, and we'll, I'll address this more after Land talks about the consumer perceptions, is we can actually then use these tools to better measure the extent to which the purchase decision was in fact influenced by the ad issue advertising. But we'll start with the consumer perceptions. <clears throat> So one thing uh, I, I do want to uh, mention, uh, um, Danny said, you know, uh, there are so many different ways uh, firms can kind of measure a customer's perception, right? And I think one thing, um, if you use survey, uh, there is one potential uh, drawback of using survey is um, it's really hard for you to measure a customer's reaction to this particular focal um, product campaign, right? Say two years in the, in the past. And if you use social media data, you have the time steps of you know when the customer responded to the ad and how they respond to the ad. We can really do a lot of deep dive analysis. So actually, I think that's something that would be uh, super beneficial. Even just you know on top of you know all the sophisticated machine learning methods, you can 
really figure out, for example, if the ad campaign was launched, you know, January of 2020 and how people respond uh, during that time period. Also, in this case, again, you know, we can easily look at, you know, customers' uh, response uh, to this focal company, and then we can run uh, quarter analysis, uh, very simple. We can start with just simply uh, doing a count of uh, customers' uh, number of reviews uh, towards the focal company. We can also do something a bit more sophisticated. We can uh, use uh, uh, off-the-shelf machine learning uh, methods uh, to really analyze the sentiment uh, of customer uh, reviews um, uh, over time. So here, you know, there are typically three different categories, uh, positive, negative, or somewhere uh, mixed or neutral. Uh, we can also see how customer sentiment towards a focal company changes over time, particularly, like I said, because we have the time stamp, so we can see how the sentiment uh, vary uh, based on uh, the type of campaign that the company launched. Um, we can also do a bit, you know, more in-depth analysis here uh, above and beyond just simply counting the number of reviews and the sentiment. We can actually look at what customers are talking about in the reviews. Again, there are two different ways of doing this. Uh, one is we call this unsupervised learning. Another way is supervised learning. So if you do unsupervised learning, essentially you let the machine try to detect the topics that customer talk about. So it's, uh, you know, you don't give the uh, you know, the machine or the, you know, uh, any uh, guidance about uh, what type of topics to look for the, you know, it's really organic, organically the machine try to identify, for example, the top 10 or top 20 topics that customers talk about. So the topics could be, you know, related to, uh, in this case, could be related to the, you know, the price, could be related to, you know, uh, how much they like the product uh, and uh, where to buy the product, et cetera. So that's one way of uh, doing a text mining is you actually, try to see the topics that customers really talk about in this particular case during those two campaigns uh, that, you know, we, uh, that's the focal point of this particular lawsuit. We can actually look at what customers are talking about. Are they really talking about topics related to clean and clear, uh, clean and natural? Or are they talking about things totally unrelated? For example, you know, the product is, is nice, I like the, you know, the price is good, etc. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing we could also do is we call something called uh, supervised learning which means that we tell the, you know, the algorithm to focus on a particular set of topics. We say, okay, here are the seven focal topics we're interested in and tell us if the reviews actually, you know, mention those topics. And also we can even measure the, the sentiment related to that particular uh, topic. So in this case, you know, for example, we can say, we really want people, we want the machine to tell us how many percent of reviews actually mention uh, anything related to clean and natural. If how many percent of reviews mention anything related to you know where to buy the product or related to the price of the product, we can also derive a sentiment measure for each topic. And we can also do something very similar uh, uh, to the public press articles about the focal company as well. So the basic idea will be very similar. Again, here you know we can say okay, well, we can do a you know simple count of the number of articles in the popular press. Uh, talk about, you know, I'll mention this term of clean and natural uh, for this focal brand uh, and compare that to the rest of the articles. You can also do image analysis. Uh, and again, you know, the, the first thing we can do is we do a simple count of the number of images that customers, you know, post on social media uh, related to this focal brand. And again, we can zoom in to the uh, construct of clean and natural. So remember that early on, I talked about we can use machine learning uh, techniques to train the uh, algorithm to identify uh, the images that score high, um, uh, you know, being clean and natural. In this case, we can actually look at, you know, all the uh, uh, images shared by customers on social media about the focal brand. We can actually compare over time if the percentage of the images that portray this uh, construct of clean and natural, uh, how they uh, the proportion uh, change uh, over time. Okay, so um, the last topic that we'll discuss in terms of the expert analysis is the second part of that question of materiality is, did this translate into sales? Because in, in some sense, that's the ultimate question um, for damages. 
And so what you can do, I think broadly speaking, is you can use these tools for machine learning and um, what conversations customers are having about the brand to more precisely measure the at issue activity. So um, the plot that I'm showing on the screen here, this just shows the sales of a beauty company over time. And we put drop down lines for the, the uh, major ad campaigns, two of which are at issue. So, you know, before we could measure precisely what um, marketing materials were, in fact, clean and natural, you may say, well, let's just look at how the sales of the company um, grew or did not grow during the ad issue campaign. So, you know, was it during the campaign or not? Zero, one. Um, but now with these new sources of data and this new machine learning um, technology, you can get a better measure of, say, the clean and the allegedly clean and natural advertising during um, the entire window here. So this is the same picture, but I'm going to take some data that we've shown in previous slides and just overlay it. So here we're just showing the uh, two lines. One is the, what we'll call the owned posts. These are the posts that are being made by example beauty company over time. And then the or that's the yellow line. And then the orange line is the earned posts. Those are the posts that customers are making where they are referencing example beauty company. Now here, we're not getting into whether those posts in fact talked about example beauty company being clean and natural. One of the big advantages of the analysis that Land just described is that we can do that. We can say, okay, I'm not going to look at how sales varied with just posts that the company was making generally or posts that third parties were making generally, but I'm going to look at the posts that actually talked about the clean and natural. And so when you do that, you get a more precise measure. The numbers are lower because most posts didn't talk about it in this example. When you do that, now you're looking at a series over time that really hones in on plaintiff's claims. So you, you pushed aside the, the, the part of the marketing that the company was doing that's less related to this claim. You uh, also are no longer focusing on what the word of mouth is um, by third parties that's also unrelated to the claim. And so this is just a simple plot. But what you can do, and some people on this call may be familiar with what's called a market response model. And that's just a model that looks at the variation over time. So similar to this chart in some outcome such as sales. And then you see if you can explain that variation with different factors. And the key factor of interest typically is the company's market. And before we could precisely measure the clean and natural marketing in particular, we would use coarser measures such as total marketing spending or number of total social media posts. But now we can really zoom in on the question of interest. And so the models are more complicated than this, and we don't need to get into the details. But this, pick, this chart is just to illustrate how you can take the output from the machine learning and you can feed that into measures of damages or the extent to which, as Amy you know, mentioned was key, the extent to which consumer purchasing decisions actually changed around the timing of the alleged um, false advertising. So we've got five minutes left. There's a lot more that we can and should cover. What I want to do maybe is to pinpoint what are the additional takeaways that we want to have you know, given this set of facts, uh, how do we how do we win the case? Essentially, we've gotten the, the pieces. How do we now bring it all together? Right. So the data on the screen in front of you is uh, is really good uh, for the defendant. It's sort of showing that not a lot of people uh, are made their purchase decision based on um, the plaintiff's theory of the applied in a natural claim, claim. So now how do you get it into evidence? Um, one of the articles that talked about the invisibility of, of AI sort of noted, I think the, the things that 
courts always know when they're looking at uh, the admissibility of expert testimony. So that would be having um, the expert be able to explain to the court what, what the AI or machine learning that was used was. So if it's an off-the-shelf product, as Lynn mentioned, explaining what the off-the-shelf product is, what, it, what the off-the-shelf product was created for, was it created for the purpose for which it was used? If it was not created for that purpose, it's, um, why is it accepted within the uh, relevant scientific community to use it for this other purpose? Walking through how it was used, um, how it was used. If it was, if it's not an off-the-shelf product, be able to explain how it was, how it was created. That its creation was done um, using uh, principles widely accepted in the relevant scientific community, that it was used that way. So, really, just ticking through those 702 factors, um, at least until it becomes um, widely used and accepted. For traditional survey evidence, we still have to do that, but you know, courts have generally seen tons, tons and tons of surveys. So, it's um, um, you, know, you have to show all those elements, but it's not maybe not hard as a lift as it as it would be for uh, evidence that courts are not as accustomed yet to seeing. Yeah, and one I'll just add one point okay. there. Um, when we have used um, evidence like this in some of our cases, what you can do is I mean the machines are great, but they're not the whole story. And so what often helps um, people understand the what the model is doing is you can pull examples you know so on that score when land was talking about that analysis that scored posts either clean and natural versus not you can pull five and five examples of here's the really high ones and you know look at it like this is consistent with your intuition and so i think that that's an important piece that you can also that, that can help a court um, and all of the parties in the litigation understand what you're yeah, I also want to add that typically when we do this type of machine learning methods, we do a lot of uh, validation. Uh, this uh, clearly, you know, a question many of you may have is, so how do you know that say, this clean and natural label you came up with actually uh, is capturing what it's supposed to capturing? So oftentimes we do do, you know, multiple uh, cross checking. We actually would, for example, uh, hire uh, another set of human coders to really uh, code independently code a set of images and we compare kind of the correlation between the human uh, judgment and the machine judgment. So uh, if the, uh, the model is working well, uh, those, uh, those two set of scores should be highly correlated. So there are, so although, you know, we call this machine learning, but, you know, we're not just, you know, keep human out of the loop. <laughs> you know, at, you know, at the beginning, we use humans to kind of identify, you know, the relevant objects. Also towards the end, we'll also bring humans back to the loop to make sure that whatever uh, method we come up with um, actually are producing scores that are relevant. So I think uh, my point is there are many, many uh, checkpoints in the process to make sure that everything is done properly. So, closing, I just want to push all three of you to ask in many ways, this is really innovative and interesting. But whenever you have something innovative and interesting, uh, proof of concept is, is hard. There's some real practical challenges. So could you just maybe give us a little laundry list of some of the difficulties? Uh, after all, the judges that you see in front of you went to law school probably 25 to 55 years ago. Um, where their idea of machine learning is chat GPT and probably not more than that. Yeah, so I mean, I think that one of the most important things is to do two things that are related. One is balancing technicality with interpretability. Um, that, that can sometimes be, uh, you need to keep that in mind. And then secondly, the, anything that, and, and, and the, Emphasize the things that are intuitive. So in, I'll go back to that example where Lan had the two types of brands. It, it, the judges can look at the two sets of brands that we're using to determine what is and isn't clean and natural. Everybody understands that. So we can emphasize that. We can say, you know, these, these are the key inputs to the model. You know, the, the machine is just going to, it's going to look over a lot of things, but fundamentally what it's doing is this set of brands is clean and natural. This is not. So 
there can be disagreement as to whether you pick the right kind of natural brands, but everybody understands that. So focusing on areas where it's more interpretable, um, I think can, can help. And then the examples just go a really long way, we found. Right? Yeah, I also want to add that there are also techniques to actually, to demonstrate, like, um, what do we mean by clean and natural, right? There is this, uh, you know, uh, a new uh, kind of uh, 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 school of thought with AI is how to make AI understandable. So for example, somebody might be asking, Okay, so you came up with a score of clean and natural. What do you mean? So we can actually, you know, have this machine learning model to, if we have a set of images that are, you know, score high for clean and natural, a set of images that score low on clean and natural, we can actually develop a model to show that what's, what are the key features in the image that drive this particular concept? Is it because of the, the color? Maybe it's the color green or the color blue? If, you know, if, if it's related to, you know, the sky, the objects, right, sky or water. So actually we can break that down to show the judges, you know, what are the key constructs in that image uh, make people form this clean and natural perception. So that's actually could be done. Maybe I'll let you close us out. Sure. So as a class of 1998, I resemble your remark. Um, <laughs> Uh, I happen to love analogizing uh, digital concepts to the analog. So I would challenge you both to come up with an analog approach. So it's to describe. Hopefully, we've conveyed it to a broad as audience as possible. Uh, law school students, business school students, practitioners, and uh, other stakeholders. On behalf of USC, thank uh, our panelists very much for their time. <laughs>